Well, my name is Zach Revner. Um, I am the quality engineer for CCS. Um, for those of you who were in the first session this morning and then the um, reporting session here after that, I got a promotion to the quality manager and then director of quality. So thankfully I got a, a rep from uh, our HR department. Um, so we can talk about that later. Um, as, quality, as the uh, quality engineer, um, well, I've, I've been with CCS for about 16 months or 18 months. Um, and I was hired about three or four weeks before our recertification, our ISO 9001 recertification audit. So I got drop kicked into, uh, into the position there. Had to figure everything out really quick. Um, I am the Qualtrics administrator for CCS. And um, we'll talk about that relationship in, in a little bit. But basically, CCS is a customer of Qualtrics. Yes, we are the parent company, but we are very much a customer. I go through the same channels for support. Um, I try and, and um, not rely on them to make any changes. In fact, I think I've taken all their permissions away as much as I can anyway, um, as, as much as they kicked and screamed. Um, so I, I do manage the CCS uh, Qualtrics system. And um, are there any other admins here? Are these mostly new users or admin? Um, I do a lot of group structure type things. Uh, we are in the process of getting our training implementation up and running. Um, right now, I think we have about 36 individual trainings to get assigned for all of our full-time new hires. Um, uh, test administration. Um, so pretty much it's all under my um, umbrella there. So also workflow development. That's something that's been a very big thing for CCS recently. Um, since I've been involved and had some, uh, I guess the additional resources to be able to work on that, we've been able to start pulling some of those processes back into Qualtrics and uh, had time to really develop those and, and, and make them work for us. And one of those things is, one, is what we're going to talk about for the most part today. Um, I'm also the ISO 9001 management representative. Um, typically in organizations that are ISO registered, that's um, a position or a, um, an honor that is reserved for the quality manager. But with CCS, compliance is a really big part of our business. We, we ship a lot of things overseas. Um, and electronics going to other countries is a, is a big deal. So um, Kevin Elam here is our quality and compliance manager, and a lot of his time is dedicated toward the compliance. So um, I get to be the management representative. Um, so I do manage the uh, quality management system. I'm also the lead internal auditor. And um, we actually use a workflow for our internal audits as well. So what does CCS do? Anybody other than the CCS people happen to know what we do? There's never an easy answer. So I know my, like my parents, I get the job to say, so what does CCS do? Oh my gosh, go through this big long explanation. <laughs> Um, this statement is taken from part of our scope statement from our ISO certificate. And in a nutshell, we design, manufacture, and integrate computers and closures for networking solutions. Um, it's a bit more complicated than that. Our, uh, what we try to do is have uh, turnkey solutions for our customers. So we are, in some cases, a value-added reseller. We'll take a system, integrate it, change it, put different cards in it. Um, and then box back up, ship it to the customer. And the idea is they open it up, plug it in, and they're ready to go. They don't have to make any changes. Um, Nasri, we don't want to add to that at all? That covered? Okay, this is our operations manager, Nasri Salmoon here. Um, we are the parent company of Qualtrics, and I would imagine hopefully everybody knows what Qualtrics does at this point. And we have another subsidiary called FoxGuard Solutions. And um, where most of the products or a, a good um, percentage of the products that CCS ships end up going to more or less harsh environments like uh, power plants. Um, there was a bit of a, a niche here that FoxGuard saw where uh, we've got critical infrastructure at these power plants and when software gets updated there's a risk that, that those updates can cause problems with their systems, maybe shut down power plants and shut down the grid or, or whatever. So uh, they offer a cybersecurity solution for those particular markets. And here's just a, a little bit of an illustration of how um, the three organizations are, are uh, laid out. We actually are under two different roofs right now. The headquarters houses all of FoxGuard, all of Qualtrics, and the sales and engineering side of CCS. And we just moved into, the operations moved into a new building 
um, about 200 yards away from our um, uh, from the uh, headquarters building where there's production and warehouse and shipping and purchasing quality. Um, I think that's about it, compliance. Um, you see there are a number of shared resources and um, one right there, I'm a service to the entire organization under the quality. Um, all three of the organizations are covered under the same uh, ISO certificate. So one of the things, you, um, if anybody knows the history of Qualtrics, in the early 90s, um, the CCS decided that they wanted to be ISO registered, and they decided that the paper way was, was not the right way. I've worked in paper systems, and we had a, um, a testimonial earlier with somebody who's worked with the paper systems before, and it's, uh, it's a big headache. So it was recognized that we can use the computers to do that type of thing, and Qualtrics was born. Um, but that same internal programming uh, concept is something that CCS does very well, and they've continued to do that throughout the years. So as new needs arise, the IP group or internal programming group develops new tools and, uh, and or modifies the old tools. And a lot of these integrate with each other, existing tools, old tools, um, and it could be that they're integrated with, with the homegrown stuff as well as uh, commercial things. Like um, we use Microsoft Dyn Dynamics GP. Um, and that integrate, is integrated with CRM. And then we've got our own tools that are integrated with that. Um, so we've got these tools throughout the organization. There are some that uh, actually interface with our customers where they can configure bills and materials. That gets sent over or pushed into sales. Sales does their thing, goes into GP and CRM, and it flows down. Uh, we've got a production dashboard. Uh, we've got an order planning dashboard. We've got a um, shipping dashboard. And it's all integrated and, and fits together. But the problem that we run into is over time with all of these, uh, this large number of tools in use, um, any changes can be very complicated. So if you've got a, a single field that's mapped in 50 different places and you decide, hey, we don't need to use this field anymore, you've got 50 tools that need to be updated. Um, so you fix one tool and you break another one. Um, as those requests come in to make improvements, the internal programming group gets spread thin. So they don't, just don't have the bandwidth to, to work on these things efficiently. So you end up with a very long lead time on improvements and changes. Um, so something we've been working on recently is there's just a, a general goal to try and reduce the number of these utilities and, and queries and things that we have. Um, I had a meeting with uh, some guys in IT and, and Ryan, tell me if I'm wrong here. I'm wrong. It was, it was something like this, some of these are very small and some of them just haven't been used in years, but I think there are actually 187 of these that are all in one place that, that require something. They're running and they've never been used or they're not linked anywhere. Um, so we, that's, that's just the ones we know about. Okay. Um, so there's a general effort or a general goal to try and reduce that, consolidate where possible, get rid of the things we don't use. Um, and in this case, if there's something that we can replace with a workflow, then we should go ahead and try and do that. Um, it's an interface that all employees have access to and are familiar with. We've had it for years. So it, it's actually something we, we do use every day. Most employees actually do use it every day. Um, we already have a number of workflows for other processes, um, um, like material requisitions, uh, I don't know, drawing changes, compliance requests, uh, anyway, probably 40 or 50 that are used commonly. Um, so if we can move these things or move these uh, processes into workflows, then we're going to reduce the demand on our internal programming team. Um, so we should free up their time so that they can work on the stuff that we do need their help on. And there are two in particular that we have completely replaced applications all together with workflows recently, or at least since I've been there. There's a material requisition request, we place something called asset tracks, and the one we'll talk about more today is the RA workflow. RA meaning returns authorization. Um, and that replaced the utility called WPT, or web project tracking. So CCS buys a lot of parts. Um, you can imagine with the, the wide variety of computers that we work with, we're constantly changing parts or building them. There's all kinds of different parts that are going into life. And um, I don't know, how many, how many line items would you say we receive in a month? Five or 10,000, something like that? 
Um, so on occasion, something has to be returned, whether it's something that was broken in transit or it was just dead on arrival. Um, occasionally we'll have units uh, for evaluation that we need to return. Maybe we overbought something or a, an order was canceled by a customer. Um, for all these reasons, we gotta have a way to get these sent back to the supplier, get a refund or get replacements or get repairs. And at some point, I'm not sure exactly when, but I think maybe about 10 or 12 years ago, our internal programming department put together something called web project tracking. And here's the, the login screen. It was a completely standalone utility. It had a little bit of integration. There was some data validation to make sure that you, you weren't putting in a, a part number that doesn't actually exist. Um, but beyond that, it pretty much was all by itself. Uh, it had its own login. Um, so you had to remember a different username and password. Um, and it was adequate, it worked for 10 years, it was, it was adequate for tracking the returns, but there were a lot of limitations and it caused uh, a lot of pain points. So here's some of those limitations. Um, the basic process is when a bad product was found, uh, might be in production, might be at receiving, um, that particular part will be red tagged. Whatever information is relevant to that red tag gets put on that, put with the part, sent to the warehouse. And then the warehouse would be tasked with actually starting the return within uh, WPT. Um, at that point, the warehouse assigns it to a buyer. And you can see on here, we've got buyers listed here. This is, once you log in, this is the first thing you see. So we've got, if there was no buyer assigned, and then each buyer had their own section in that interface. And there were no email notifications. So a new return gets started and it's there, but nobody finds out about it unless somebody goes and tells you or sends you an email or something. Um, so we had to log in frequently, maybe ideally, I guess, daily with daily management. But um, the way it turned out is a lot of things or a lot of these returns ended up sitting for a long time. So no email notifications, had to log in frequently to, to uh, see if you had a new return to handle. And it just wasn't very visible. Um, I heard somebody say just a couple of days ago that didn't even know this existed for the first year they worked here. And um, it's probably six months before I even found out about it. And I don't have a lot of good stats on this, but um, about a year ago, um, from what I could tell, from start to finish, these returns could, could sit open anywhere from three to four or five months. It's not very efficient. Um, other limitations, there was and is no security outside of having a login. So once you're logged in, you can make changes to anything you want. Um, I tested that just a couple of days ago, opened up a record from I think 2005, added some text to a field, saved it, it didn't care. So um, not a lot of security there. Um, there was very little date stamping. There was, you can see a date initiated right here, and I think that and the date that it was closed were the only time stamps in the system. So there's no telling when any of this actually happened in the middle. Um, so there's no way to really gauge outside of what was typed in these text fields here. Um, there's no way to really gauge any vendor performance or anything like that. It's difficult to get any good um, um, trends or anything out of it. Um, there were character limits on text fields. There's a critical designation and you may see right here, is this critical? In this case it was no. If it was yes, you put yes there, and that was all that happened. It just said yes right there. So um, we actually had a workflow outside of this for critical RAs. Um, um, so that if we had a, a, an order that was waiting that we needed to have a part immediately. Um, there were no approval stages. Once it was initiated, it was in that buyer's inbox, and they worked it till it was finished, and then it closed, and, and that was it. And um, no way to attach any photos or, or other relevant documentation. So all we had was return notes. We could write a little bit in there and there was a reason for a return. But beyond that, there's very little, very little detail included. And then reporting was also an issue. If you knew exactly what you were looking for, you could usually find it. Um, but beyond that, um, the, the uh, reporting was very limited. Um, Nothing was customizable. If you wanted to have a report that was relevant, you had to start an IT ticket and wait the six months or a year or indefinitely to actually have it put together for you. So I think I still have a few of those outstanding. So maybe we can talk about that later, Ryan. <laughs> 
So all in all, it was, it was basically just a, a frustrating program. It served its purpose. Uh, we made it through, I think, in the, the 10 years it was um, in service. It was in the range of 5,000 returns that were handled in it. Um, but we needed to move on to something better. Um, so most of the problems that I've identified here that uh, were pain points for all the users of WPT are ones that are part of the core functionality of Qualtrics. So Qualtrics is an excellent option for replacing WPT, and vice versa, WPT was an excellent option to replace with Qualtrics. So here's the sun rising over the, the workflow here. Uh, the purchasing department got together and um, with the intention of uh, putting together a workflow, uh, or at least the flow chart that the uh, workflow would be made on, and um, I want to go through all the different stages. So what are the different paths that a product can go through, or the item can go through when it gets returned? And well, I'll just walk through this whole thing. So once it gets initiated, it goes to have a buyer assigned, um, and at that step, um, actually an email goes to all of the purchasing group and they all have responsibility right there to assign it to a buyer. So at that point, here's the assigned buyer. They have to contact the manufacturer and kind of disposition what's supposed to happen with the part. Um, if it's going to be repaired, there's two different options for that. One is repair at CCS, which would either be um, somebody in-house fixing it or sent the uh, manufacturer or supplier sending a technician to fix it, or repair at the manufacturer, where it would be boxed up, shipped to the manufacturer, to be repaired and then received. Um, for both of those, once it's received or once it's, it's um, uh, back in, uh, in a repaired status, then the warehouse wait, has it. And uh, I'm sorry, once it's assigned to be repaired, it goes to the warehouse um, state here. Once it is repaired, and they say, hey, it's repaired, QA, come take a look at it. So now we've got an inspection in the process there. Um, once QA takes a look and says, yeah, this, this meets our requirements, then it goes back to the warehouse to be put back into stock and um, if there are any fees associated with it, um, then a list field exception will have it go to the accounting department to uh, make sure those fees are paid or accounted for, and then it gets closed. Um, if the uh, disposition is to uh, replace it, then it'll still get returned to the manufacturer, um, but it'll go to a warehouse state to wait for the, uh, the, the replacement to arrive. Once it's here, then it can go back into stock and get closed. Um, the last two, loss allocation, um, that is, we're gonna write it off. Um, so it's here, we say we're gonna write it off, goes to accounting to, to handle that, and then warehouse makes sure that it's removed from the system, and then it's closed. And then if the manufacturer says, just get rid of it, we're gonna give you a credit, then it goes straight to accounting for that, and then closed. Um, this was made, this uh, flow chart, I don't know if any of you have used the workflow, what is it called, the workflow designer tool from Qualtrics, um, uh, but I've been using this to create and to uh, maintain or, or track all the modifications to workflows. And this one's a little bit busy. This is probably on the complex side for, for a lot of the workflows that we handle. Um, but the reason I have all these little flags here, you can see the key, these, are, these were actually used while I was setting up the email notifications as kind of a check off to make sure that I've got all the email notifications in place. So as I was putting them in, I put the flag there. Um, so, any questions on that? That's pretty. We've got all kinds of colors we can put in there. All right, so here's what's good about it. Um, and as most of you know, this is really just a rundown of the resume of the, the workflow section of Qualtrics, but upon initiation, our workflow is assigned to all purchasing. I already mentioned everybody gets an email, and then they assign it to who should be handling it. Um, and of course, email notifications are sent on every transition to the relevant parties, and um, that saves everybody the time of having to, to log in every day or constantly to see if there's anything new. Next, workflows can only be altered by responsible parties. So I can't, well, I can, but typically people wouldn't be able to just go in and look and uh, uh, change something if they wanted to. Um, so like I said, admin rights would be required to change anything that's been closed. No character limits on the text fields. Um, the critical versus non-critical designation, uh, we actually have an email set up with lots of pretty colors in that, bright red, bold letters, let people know it is critical. Um, so it gets that extra attention. 
Uh, we've included the approvals and inspections in place to make sure that if something is supposedly repaired, that it actually is repaired. Um, we have the document fields where we can attach pictures and, and whatever other relevant documentation we need. Um, and of course, it goes just to the people that, that it needs to go to. And we've got all the different paths for the different paths that the, the uh, item would actually take, so rather than just going into one person's inbox and waiting for it to be done. So as with any Qualtrics workflow, everything's searchable. Reporting is, is so much better here than it is with, with the uh, WPT. We can make it look like anything we want, get all the information that we want, export it to Excel, uh, manipulate it any way we need to. Of course, we can build all the custom reports around it if we want to as well. So as of the end of January 2013, WPT was retired. It's no longer used. And uh, I think we've probably done in the neighborhood of 50 or 75 returns with the uh, RA workflow. So, and there's, there's Nasri down there. Yes. <laughs> Any questions on that? OK. So this is just kind of a quick snapshot of some of the other workflows that we've worked on and, and uh, upgraded recently. And you can see I've, been, I've used the workflow design tool extensively to try and document these. In most cases, they are workflows that already existed, and we've just um, either documented what the flow actually is to make it a little bit easier to look at, or we've created new workflows, um, and, and these are the um, flow charts that are generated by that. So full range, this is just a, a, a short list. I want to say there probably are 50 or so that are used on a regular basis. All right, integration. Um, integration is something that Qualtrics wasn't necessarily built to do originally, but with uh, all the automation that's, that's uh, uh, kind of the way everything's going nowadays, it's something that's starting to be built into the product more and more. And correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's four six. there's going to be some big improvements to the API layer, so um, this is going to just get better and better. <clears throat> So we've integrated to an extent with what we can. Uh, we try to make it work for us uh, pretty well. So I've got a few examples to look at of that. And here we go again. Here's the RA workflow. We've already looked, looked at that. But this actually um, talks to GP. And um, in this case, since we're just dealing with vendors um, or with suppliers, this field, this is a list field that um, actually logs into GP, grabs the entire list of our suppliers, and you can choose exactly who this is going to be sent back to. Um, another, another one is the NCR workflow. I've heard a lot about cars and PARs or, or Kappas this morning. This is the one that we use. Um, this combines corrective actions, preventive actions, and supplier corrective actions. And there's a different path for each one of those. So um, a typical nonconformance or a um, corrective action is going to go straight through the middle. Once it's created, it gets assigned to a responsible party. They do their thing, goes to QA for verification, and then it goes through one other layer of verification. Supplier corrective actions are similar, but it goes through our vendors, vendor uh, development um, uh, to handle those. And then preventive actions, since they're more proactive, um, there's not quite as many required fields for that, so that follows a, follows a different path. But the integration here, similar to um, the RA workflow, we've got a customer field, one for CCS, one for Qualtrics. The difference is, or the reason there's two is because there's two separate GP deployments, one for Qualtrics and one for CCS. So uh, we can't combine the two, so those are separate. In the event it's a Qualtrics customer complaint, we can, we can uh, use that. If it's CCS, we'll use the other. And then the same field for the suppliers is included as well. And we've taken a little further downstream. Um, I have redacted a few customer-related bits of information on here because Najri requested that. But um, this is a screenshot of our production dashboard. This is what uh, our uh, technicians actually see when they log into their systems and, and go to start working on a particular order. And <clears throat> it's a little bit hard to see here, but the red circle here um, this is, and under this black box is a, a link to a build sheet that's stored in Qualtrics. And it will only be a live link 
if that build sheet is in published status. If it's in anything other than that, then there's going to be a note there that says build sheet and edit contact manufacturing team for an updated version. Um, so this is just a stop in the process. It ensures that our guys can't be using any outdated uh, materials or outdated build sheets. Um, and uh, one extra piece there is the build sheet is actually an inspection sheet. So a portion of it gets printed out and they have to use that. It, it travels or it goes with, um, with the order. So this is a true stop. Even if they knew what the work instructions were, they couldn't continue because there's a piece of information that they actually have to print out. So a few other things um, that fall under the integration category. Um, we've got another feature in that production dashboard where we can create links to Qualtrics documents similar to the build sheet, um, but it can be associated with part numbers or bills and materials or customers. Um, so that any time one of those appears, we can have a flyer or an extra set of instructions also appear. Uh, one example is um, we have a product where I think it's a, a 4U rack mount system where there's a back plane and there's a, another card that sits on top of it vertically. And there's a free end, there's a processor there, and typically on a processor you've got a real heavy heat sink right near that free end. So when that ships, it gets tipped on its side, and there's a lot of weight and extra um, forces where they're not intended to be. And um, it's not uncommon for when those arrive for the little plastic retainer clips to actually be broken. So we had some extra set of instructions um, that's associated anytime there's a backplane part number because we, never, we don't know exactly what designs these are going to show up with. So every time we have a part number that's a backplane, we know this is a pot potential issue. So we've got a link to this extra set of instructions that says, hey, you need to take some extra steps to make sure these are secure. Um, so it's something that uh, was just rolled out recently. It seems to be working pretty well. Um, another example of integration, shipping dashboard. Um, we have a workflow called the outbound shipping request. And that can be for personal shipments. Say you sell something on eBay and you want to ship it, or you want to send a birthday present to your grandmother, um, or if it's business related, we have options for that as well. <clears throat> um, and when there is a new outbound shipping request, it goes to the shipping department, pops up on the shipping dashboard as an extra line item. This is something you need to do today. And um, then they process it from there. And um, Another way we, we use um, integration is something we call CTQ forms. And what that stands for is critical to quality. And it's a production traveler. Um, there is a template that exists in Qualtrics. And our systems outside of Qualtrics, when these get printed in the warehouse to start a new order, um, they are automatically, they're, the CTQ form is automatically populated with whatever relevant information, whether it's a certificate of conformance or if, if uh, compliance is required or order number and ship date and customer and all that information. So this draws a blank form out of Qualtrics, automatically populates it, and then uh, prints it from there. I think that's, yeah, that's, that's how we use integration in Qualtrics at this point. I'm actually anxious to find out what 4.6 is going to do for us, but... Uh, so I didn't know how long I was going to take on those, those first two, so I threw in an extra section here for um, uh, just some, some things that I've been doing with workflows recently. Uh, so here's a couple of little, little tips that I've been um, trying to use when, when doing workflow development. Um, first of all, use the Qualtrics Workflow Designer. Um, if you're just doing a straight line workflow or there's just a couple of states, maybe it's not all that... Um, beneficial because it's really easy to visualize, but for anybody who's used the um, uh, admin screen to actually build a workflow, if you start getting a little more complicated than that, it's nearly impossible to just look at it and tell what's going on. So the, the, uh, the visual of the um, flowchart itself is, is very valuable. Um, something I've been doing recently, mainly for me, um, but to kind of keep myself honest, is I'll actually put a revision level on these. So just add an extra box, put a date and a, and a revision level. Now save these files outside of Qualtrics, but these get uploaded and they're attached to the, to the um, workflow so that I can see when was the last time I made a change to this because it's happened recently where I've, something didn't quite line up and I needed to know when it, and when a change was made. So um, this is something I've been doing recently. Um, also you can, uh, HTML is, is available in a number of different fields within uh, the workflows. So 
something else I've been doing recently is including the flow charts in the workflows themselves. So anytime somebody's looking at a state, that flow chart is, is available. All you got to do is scroll down to see it. Um, so it's, I've gotten a lot of questions on, you know, what, where does this go next and, and uh, what is, what's actually happening here? So that's been able to uh, answer a lot of those questions for me. And um, I've included just an example of that, that HTML code. Um, and in this case, uh, of course, you'd have to replace the server name with your own and then the workflow ID with your own. But <clears throat> once that flow chart is attached to the uh, workflow, then use that link or, or um, uh, put that text in the header or the footer. And in this case, this would actually um, bring up a copy of the, uh, I'm sorry, this would be a link to the flowchart. So this would bring up a, a, um, a new window of the flowchart so you can see what's actually happening. If you didn't want to jumble or, or include that in, um, in the workflow instance itself, this would just be a link to it. This is the one where add this little bit of code to it, replace those same bits of information, and in this case, I've got it in the footer. You can see it's below the buttons. Here's workflow flowchart. Scroll down and see it to answer that question. HTML is also available in the um, title and description of the uh, custom fields. So um, something that started recently was to, in, in this case, this is an um, internal audit workflow, and we're trying to link all the internal audits with the NCRs or non-conformances that were found. So in the past, we had this, this internal audit workflow, and we would just have a text field and type in what the NCRs were that were generated, or the, the cars and pars. Um, and this just makes it, takes a couple of steps out of the process. So put this little bit of HTML in the description field of your um, uh, custom field, and click on that, and it'll open up a new instance of, in this case, the NCR workflow, <clears throat> or whatever you want it to be, in a new window. And HTML is also available in the headings of um, subforms. I don't know if any of you have used subforms. It's something we've used a lot recently. And if you use the, if, if the titles on the subforms are wide or, or long and you've got a lot of them, then it can end up filling up the screen and, and just not looking very good. So in this case, just add a simple line break in those titles and you can have it go down to the next line and it can make it look a lot cleaner. The one thing to, to know about that, though, is I believe it's a 50 character limit in the headings of subforms. So you're a little bit limited in, in uh, how much you can actually include. And just for the record, HTML is also available in test questions. So any of the testing administrators out there, this is a, an example where it, it made sense to have a photograph included um, in a test question. So. Sky's the limit on, on what kind of HTML you want to include there. And this one um, is something that I started doing as our workflows were getting more complex. Um, if you've got just a straight line workflow, um, I don't know if this would really make sense, but in the workflow design, you have fields that are new to the states and fields from old states. And so um, if you've got a field that's new to that state, when you're in that state, at the very top is where those appear. And then there's the, your transitions below that, and then there's all the fields from the other states below that. Um, it makes sense if you have workflows that have parallel paths and that all use the same uh, fields. So like these three paths here all basically use the same information. There's just some subtle differences there. Um, just for consistency, I didn't want to have a new field here that appeared to be an old field here and an old field here. So what I've started to do is, is actually add all the fields for the entire workflow on the initiate state and just turn them off, make them so they're not visible. That way <clears throat> they're all available to be in the same section. You can put them any way you want and in any order that you want on all the subsequent states. So it allows for uniformity between similar states and parallel paths and have more control over the field placement. And I think this is the last one I got. I have gotten a lot of requests to cancel workflows that never were or that have gotten to a point and we decided not to continue for whatever reason. Um, there are 
quite a few that people will start. They save the changes. I guess that number sits in the inbox and just sits there for years and years. So they say, hey, can you help me out and, and cancel these workflows? And yes, we can delete them, but that's a lot of effort on the uh, administrator's part. So when I get those requests, um, I'm, I may go ahead and take care of the one they're asking about, but in this case, um, where it makes sense, I'll just go ahead and go into the workflow and add a cancel. Mm -hmm. Oh, and, and just add the cancel button so that, so that the user can do it themselves. And the thing to watch out there for is, is um, you don't want to give every state the option to cancel because maybe something has happened and it needs to finish out because you wouldn't want to leave those loose ends. But for the most part, on an initiate state, if it's something that just never actually happened, then it makes sense to have that cancel button so that you reduce the number of calls. Um, 